Well, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed, dear saints. Thank you for joining us on this first Friday after Easter Sunday. And as we gather again today, we begin a little bit differently than we do the rest of the time. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. Alleluia. Alleluia. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that fall asleep. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give him the honor. Do his name. Alleluia. Alleluia. Well, as we gather today, our psalm is Psalm 145, 1 through 9, and we are in Hebrews 12, Hebrews chapter 12. Hear the psalm for today. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness." The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Well, again, in the psalm, we're going to see a representation into the reading in Hebrews of what's going on here. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. Today, one of the topics we take up is discipline. And what discipline looks like. Not necessarily discipline for evil, but discipline that allows us to continue to do the same things over and over again, even sometimes when things are unpleasant. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. I know that you have heard me say this, and Pastor Mercer too. Are you in God's Word every day? Are you reading? Are you listening? Are you studying? Are you listening to the devotions? How is your spiritual discipline? And that's a little bit what we take up today in Hebrews chapter 12. Well, here the writer to the Hebrews as he lays this out for us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may may not grow weary or faint-hearted." In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addressed you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have endured. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are an illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best for them, but he disciplines, (laughs) excuse me, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, 
The, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it become and some by it become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. For you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a, bee, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and feastal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteousness made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than that of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. If you've been watching the progression that's been going on in Hebrews, you can just see how the writer continues to build us up, continuing to build on the foundation. Yesterday we talked about uh, that great faith chapter, chapter 11. By faith, by faith, over and over again, we see the, the accounts of the patriarchs and some very difficult times, and yet by faith they believed. Well, that leads us right into what happens when what happens when Christianity is hard? What happens when life is hard and we don't understand things? What happens when we want to quit? Well, listen to this first paragraph that Paul writes. Therefore, because of chapter 11, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. We can look back through the scriptural account and see all of those faithful, Abraham and Sarah and Abraham being asked to slaughter his son and yet he was willing and God spared him. We can look back and see, excuse me, Moses as he, he says to God at the beginning of Exodus, I'm a man of thick tongue and I can't speak for you and yet he goes before Pharaoh and leads Israel out and trust that God will continue to show these mighty miracles that he showed to Pharaoh and then he showed to Israel as well. We can go right down the list of the Old Testament and we can see all of those faithful who have been pointing us to Christ. Faithful witnesses. We look at the New Testament and we see uh, all of the disciples giving their life for Jesus, being martyred for Jesus except for John. John died an old man. We see all of these witnesses, and we have to remember what that name witness means, that word witness. We look at it here as one who confesses Christ. The word actually means martyr, if we translate it correctly. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of martyrs. And, and remember, the context is not only those who were killed for their faith, but those who witnessed, those who lived their life with a discipline that allowed them to push back the sin that, sin that grabs and stays so closely and continue to be where God is. Continue to live by faith, trusting in the promises of Jesus, 
repenting of our sin through that faith, and living in the joy of being forgiven. Discipline, even when things are tough. I love that how Paul lays this out. Looking to Jesus, that's how we do discipline. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now we're just coming off of Holy Week. We've heard the accounts of how Jesus was crucified. How could there be joy in the cross? How could there be joy for Jesus as he looks at it and knows that his flesh will be flayed off his body? He'll be beaten and mocked and nailed and scorned and eventually give up his life. How could that be joy? Well, dear saints, the joy is you. The joy is that Jesus endured all of this so people might live in faith and know their Father and be taken one day to be with him in heaven. And for the current, for the, for the immediate, that we might, by the faith he's given to us that clings to the promise of Christ, be encouraged all the more today. Looking at the prophets, looking at the martyrs, looking at the people in your own life, who continued to model this faith. When I was growing up, I didn't necessarily think that, I was, that the faith was being modeled, but it was. We were done with chores early on Sunday morning and in the house early to clean up and get to church by 8 o'clock every Sunday. I can't ever remember a time when we didn't go unless the weather would prohibit us. For those who have gone before us, those faithful witnesses that continued to show this discipline of Christ, of being where God is to receive his gifts. One of the great images that sticks in my head when I think of that cloud of witnesses is every time we sat down at a meal growing up, every time we were at the table, before we ate, before we did anything, we prayed. And I would be done with the prayer and ready to eat and I would look over at dad and dad would still have his hands folded and his head bowed and quietly continue to pray. What a great witness to see that in the midst of all of the busyness it's still most important to give thanks to God for the gifts he's given to us and he was most likely praying for us as a family as well. What a great cloud of witnesses we are surrounded by. And not only there, but the very saints that gather with us in worship. More witnesses. More people enduring and encouraging each other. Who for the joy that was set before him, the joy that Jesus endured the cross for, was the fact that you and I would now have faith as a gift from him, and live in that, and then one day come to be with him, despising the shame of the cross, despising all of the things that the cross meant. He did not despise you. He took your sin, took your death, paid the price, and gave you his holiness. The writer goes on and says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you might not grow weary or faint-hearted. There's a struggle in being a Christian. There's a struggle in this world as we go forward. The struggle is the world would have us pull away from the truth of Christ. The world would have us push aside all these promises and live the way you want to live. Do the things you want. No discipline, no self-discipline, just simply doing whatever you want. We would identify that sin as hedonism. Just doing whatever pleases you without any regard to anything. And that certainly seems to be the way that our society is going. But we've been called to something different. We've been called to the Christian faith, which very clearly lays out sin and where that sin will leave us. And sometimes when our hand is slapped, sometimes when we are disciplined, sometimes when our conscience weighs down on us because of our sin, we want to run, we want to get away, we want to be mad at blame God. But listen to what he says. It is for discipline that you have to endure. 
God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If God does not discipline us, he does not love us. And that's very clear. He doesn't discipline us to take things away because he enjoys that. He disciplines us because he knows the things that we're doing that we get in trouble with will kill us and will separate us from Christ. Discipline is always for our good. We don't always see that. And we most of the time don't like that. We don't like to be disciplined because we're selfish and self-centered and want to do our own things. But just look at the great cloud of witnesses around us. Look at what Jesus did in the last three days of his life when he easily could have brought legions of angels to come down and clean the clocks of all of those soldiers who came. He could have wiped them off the face of the earth, and he didn't. Discipline. So he could go to the cross through all of that suffering so that you, dear child of God, would be forgiven and would never see that damnation and that separation from Christ. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. You see, discipline is training. Training in righteousness. Training in faith that we heard in chapter 11. By faith, by discipline, by training, we trust in God and his promises. And he does not leave the reward for that until someday long in the future. There are glimpses where we see how that discipline pays off, where we continue to trust in God and his promises. We continue to pray, and sometimes he answers just as quick as we've prayed. There's one last quote in here that we need to talk about just for a second. See that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. A root of bitterness. I was visiting with a couple just this week, and as we were talking about things that can become very challenging to a marriage, I was talking about the seeds of bitterness. People start to complain about their spouse or about others or about things, and before long those seeds grow, and if they are not weeded out, it overtakes the garden. The seeds of discipline, the seeds of bitterness need to be weeded out, and we do that through First of all, not being where people are complaining, but also by confessing that sin and asking for forgiveness. And God gives that to us. What a wonderful chapter as we see very clearly as we go forward that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses in the scriptures and in our world that we may continue to run the gift of run the race of faith with endurance and at the end will win the prize of eternal life and life with Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we worked through the Lord's Supper, so now we begin back with baptism. The first part, what is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, but it is water included in God's command and combined with God's word. Which is that word of God, Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to be disciplined in this Christian faith. We pray. Father, we thank you that you treat us as sons, that you discipline those whom you love, not in order to cause us grief, but to pull us away from those very things that will kill us, to give us your peace. Continue to strengthen us, Father, that we might resist the evil. Hear us now as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. 
And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. Join me tomorrow, dear saints, and we'll continue in the book of Hebrews. Go in his peace.